today we are going to discuss about monetization market regulation and indian ocean trade during delhi sultanate which will cover 13th 14th and 15th century now with the advent of delhi sultanate monetization or the use of money in india changed and the quality of money also improved now initially during the ghaznavid period hindu shahi coins were abundantly used in areas of kabul and lahore and these coins moved up to rajasthan and incidentally these coins were also used in the central part of north india but with iltutmish standardization reached a new height now of course one has to understand that supply of silver and gold the metal silver and gold always came from outside so money the the use of money and manufacturing of money or is dependent on this supply now standardization of iltutmish reduced the amount of silver in these coins so much so that the ratio of copper to silver or rather silver to copper was 1 is to 80 now if we come to the value of silver coins with that of copper one can say that it was 1 is to 48 copper coins were called jittals and silver coins were known as tankas now after the control of devagiri by delhi sultanate this value was around 1 is to 50 but of course in north india it remained 1 is to 48 now as the empire expanded the control of silver and gold came into the hands of delhi sultanate and they were able to change this hoarded silver and gold into or rather the reserves into coins so there was a supply of more and more coins into the market now this supply of coins definitely gave an impetus to trade and commerce now after alauddin khalji what we see is there was an attempt by mohammed bin toglak to introduce token currency though this concept of token currency came from china it was not successful but it if it was successful then it could have combated the scarcity of the supply of silver and gold but it was unfortunately not successful now during alauddin khalji's time we see a surplus of silver coins being minted so much so that it was also used during the toglak period and it is noted that when timur came to india he saw the use or use of uh, silver coins that was issued by alauddin khalji during firoz tolak remember that there was a huge scarcity of silver coins and of course gold coins and silver and gold coins at a point of time became commemorative now from compared to 13th century 14th century there was definitely a scarcity of coins because of the scarcity of the supply of silver and gold. now in 15th century we see kashmir sultans issuing gold coins which were commemorative now in the same 15th uh, century we see the sultans of jaunpur gujarat uh, issuing silver coins which were again commemorative we also hear about the smaller denominations like dirham in the market but this standardization definitely gave an edge to trade and commerce areas like bengal used cowries because of the availability of it like one hears about bengal's trade with maldives in cowries there was an absence of use of coin here now let us move on from this monetization this picture of monetization into market control now or market regulation now the subsistence cost was a uh, low during this period and there was an attempt by alauddin khalji to control the manufacturing products now this somehow uh, 
made the wages low. The contemporary social like Ziauddin Barani gave us an idea that Alauddin Khalji strictly regulated the market regulation, the market. Now, one has to understand that it is very difficult to control the whole of the empire or even the peripheral area of the empire. One can say definitely that this market regulation was prevalent in areas from say Lahore to China in south and Katihar in the east. But apart from this, uh, in the peripheral areas, definitely market reg regulation was not uh, controlled. And of course, this market regulation wa was initially done because of, of, of the armed forces. It facilitated the lives of the armed forces in the Canton areas. Now, let us from here move on to Indian Ocean trade. Now, Indian Ocean trade, you have to understand that during this period, that is 13th, 14th and 15th century, was in a process of continuity. And we also saw a huge change in the trade. This change was in the technology of the shipbuilding. The changes occurred in the, in the consumption pattern of the consumers, the, the nature of the traders and the bulk of the trade. Now, Indian Ocean trade definitely uh, has to be seen from uh, the point that it was continuity of the past because the the process of uh, process of trade uh, did not stop before 13th century. Now, what happened in the 13th century that we see that in the whole of Asia there was an attempt. Uh, to bring about a kind of a political stability. Now, this political stability again initiated a stability in the maritime activity. And India played definitely a very, very important part. Now, we are going to now move on to the components of these activities. Now, first of all is... Uh, all the major sources talk about how India became the consumer of the world gold. Now, it, this has been seen from time immemorial that India hoarded gold, the international gold, in lieu of its products. Now, this has been reported by, let's say, uh, Persian historians like Wasaf, uh, then geographers like Alumari, and even till the 17th century Bernier, uh, traveler Bernier reported of this. Now, let us come now to the fact as to how trade was conducted, in what trade was conducted. Interestingly, uh, the trade of the Indian Ocean depended largely on the monsoon winds. Now, monsoon winds, if you take India's strategical position, changed in its east and in the west coasts, that is Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. Now, because of this, we see that the, the, uh, in, from 1175 onwards, transshipment became a key feature of this trade. And this transshipment took place in India. Now, uh, a particular kind of a vessel called Dao brought goods in India from the west now, these goods were then moved to another vessel called the Chinese junk and then this junk took the goods towards China. What was the difference between this junk and the Dao ves vessels? If you see historically, junk was definitely a technology that came uh, into being, the, the time particularly is not known, but it, it is Chinese made. And junk uh, compared to Dao is larger. But Dao was more equipped to move in the winds, wind conditions uh, that is west of India, that is in the Arabian Sea and way up to Persian Gulf. But Chinese junk was more equipped to move in the monsoon condition or the monsoon winds in the eastern part of India. So therefore you can understand how important India's uh, strategical position was. So therefore the goods which were brought from Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean in 
dough changed uh, it it changed the vessels and then it moved upward to china so this was this roughly continued till the advent of the europeans uh, and one also has to understand that china played a very very important role the chinese market and the trade that centered around china was much larger compared to europe particularly of the period that we are talking now let us move on to the goods that were uh, there in the trade now first of all let us uh, see as to what was in demand in the chinese market or china per se now china had a huge demand for spices one has to understand that the spices that were produced in china that is cinnamon or ginger those were exported by china china on the contrary uh, had a huge demand for pepper and this pepper went from the malabar coast of india to china though there was pepper uh, produced in indonesia and in certain parts of ceylon but definitely malabar pepper was in high demand in the chinese market in the writings of marco polo what we see is marco polo uh, admits that the demand of pepper in chinese market was much higher than the demands of pepper in europe so you can understand the amount of consumption that this chinese market had apart from that uh, cotton cloth was in high demand in china now it is so noted that the chinese silk was less expensive compared to the cotton that went from bengal traditionally the areas of coromandel bengal and gujarat were the exporters of cotton cloth to china there are sources which says that chinese silk was comparatively less expensive than indian cotton that was available in the chinese market now it in the chinese market deccani diamond was also in high demand because it was very hard a uh, stone and it could scratch the pearls and even the less expensive stones that were available or rather that were imported into china now china on the other hand exported huge amount of porcelain and silk now silk that they exported was reoven in many parts of the world especially in india chinese brocade was very expensive and had a high demand not only in india but also in europe now india had a huge demand for luxury goods and spices that was not produced in india now in the luxury goods interestingly apart from perfumes or very expensive clothes you have flora and fauna which included like uh, fauna included like zebra giraffe or from africa certain birds uh, and also african baobab as a plant now from here if we can see as to what were the goods that was in demand in cairo now indian cairo had a very long traditional relationship in cairo interestingly indian cloth did not have much of a market instead iron and steel which was uh, which which was considered to have a high quality was in demand and staple food was in demand in parts of south arabia persian gulf and in certain parts of north africa and east africa now teak especially from the malabar teak or the teaks of the of the rainforest of india was in high demand in the teakless or, or rather the treeless areas of arabia and persian gulf so therefore one can say that long route trade was there and there were shorter route trades of let's say between india and maldives or china and indonesia these were the smaller route trades along with the long routes which took say let's say which started from china and it ended up in arabia if we move on from here to see as to what were the upcoming areas in the indian ocean trade one was indonesia now 
Indonesia during this period was going through a political change. The Srivijaya culture or the Srivijaya influence of Indonesia was subsiding and Islamization was becoming important. Now remember that the Muslim merchants in the Indian Ocean trade who flocked to many areas of China, India, Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, had a tremendous role to play in this Islamization. Now again, if you look into the involvement of the Indian merchants, uh, you know that during the ancient period in Southeast Asia, Hindu and Buddhist influence was very strong in Southeast Asian empires. Now this cultural milieu gave an edge or gave an impetus to the Indian traders' involvement in these areas. So therefore, what we see is traders were area specific, but they had huge amount of mobility. So then you can, you can always notice that areas of Canton, or Zeton in China had traders from Arabia or Persia or let's say India, or Chinese traders moving up to Persian Gulf, Arabian Sea, so this was a noted feature in the Indian Ocean trade. But one thing about these traders that, uh, that were there in the Chinese market, one can say that Chinese trade was always in the hands of the foreigners or the foreign traders because somehow these traders were not Chinese in culture. Now in Zeton, suppose the traders were subjects of the state but somehow they were not they were not part of the confucian bureaucracy so the traders maintained their own identity but in case of india somehow the traders over the years had familiarized themselves with the land so all these things were happening now these kind of cultural changes were happening during the period of our discussion now let us now move on to how these traders trade operated because you have to remember that Indian Ocean was always popular for piracy. Now ships were always armed. In this case you have uh, a huge role, um, role was played by the African slaves. Now the African slaves were a commodity that came from Africa and they served the Chinese and the Indian courts and courts in and around Asia. But apart from that, they were the armed men who guarded the ships. Now this has been noted by travelers, geographers and historians. Now they were very popular, so much so that Amir Khasru, a poet of the 13th century as you know, he could distinguish between an Habshi and a Zinzi slave. So therefore one can understand that these slaves had different mar mar market prices and they were in high demand during this period. Another very important commodity that was consumed by the Indians was the war horses of Mid-Asia. Now we hear about the Pandian Kingdom which was in the interior of South India during the medieval times which had a huge demand for Iraqi horses. Now horses were bred all over South Arabia and in the Persian Gulf and it was a prized item which moved to India. Now a huge revenue was uh, involved in this and until the advent of the Europeans of course war horses was the very important commodity between Arabia or let's say Persian Gulf in Arabia and India in this Indian Ocean market. Now India alone consumed almost 80% of the war horses which moved from this area to the east. So one has to understand that these are the commodities over which the Indian Ocean market thrived. Uh, the traders definitely maintaining their identity was able to control this area or this trade. One has to understand that these are the commodities over which the Indian Ocean market thrived. Uh, the traders definitely maintaining their identity was able to control this area or this trade and 
before the advent of the Europeans. Now, this was the a condition in which Indian Ocean trade prevailed. Ma'am, you talked about slaves being exported to India. Now, uh, did these slaves had any particular role to play in Indian politics? Uh, we hear about uh, in the 13th century, 13th, 14th century, these political, uh, these slaves playing a very important role in the center. That is, you know about Razia and her connection with an Abyssinian slave. In John Poor, we hear about a slave, a Hapshi slave, uh, coming to uh, political, becoming a political head. Therefore, one has to understand that once the slaves were brought here, they were absorbed in the political scenario for different purposes. They automatically gained power and became important. So, you have to understand that these slaves, some of them were trained slaves. They were trained uh, in arms and munitions. So automatically they will gain power and they will gain political power. Therefore that is very important to note. Uh, especially the Hapshi slaves, they were very popular for their political rule in Asian politics. So let us come to the conclusion of this lecture that you have to understand that 13th, 14th, 15th century an economic change was ushered with the advent of the Delhi Sultanate. Uh, standardization of money changed, the use of money became more and more, and trade and commerce flourished. Now, Indian Ocean trade, on the other hand, flourished not only in the hands of the Delhi Sultanate, but throughout Asia, the political stability brought about a huge change in the nature of Indian Ocean trade, which influenced the next uh, centuries in law. Till the advent of the Europeans, definitely trade was in the hands of the Asians and the merchants maintained their own identity. Certain commodities became very popular and was in high demand and definitely a lot of technological changes ushered in the making of the shipbuilding process.